Well, hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I am your host, Mike, the Dragonfly Wizard. You can find me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter. I am the product manager for Dragonfly at ORS, and I am your host for the Dragonfly Daily. You can connect with me on Twitter, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn or ResearchGate, and you can always watch our videos on YouTube. So this video is part of a longer playlist of the Dragonfly Daily. It's in orss.ca slash ytp2, and that's where you can find this playlist of the Dragonfly Daily. So today's content for the Daily is writing a custom custom menu item extension. This is lesson 32. If you are watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. So do want to thank you all for attending and I need you to be patient with me today. I am doing some examples here of things I never do. I'm not really involved in the business of writing extensions, but since I'm here to teach you how to do things in Dragonfly, I'm going to do my best to teach you exactly that. So just as a reminder, this completes the five lesson series on customization and automation, the five five episode series as part of the Dragonfly Daily where we started with Macro Player and Macro Builder. Then we looked at the Python console and the script runner tool, then some more developer tools inside Dragonfly specifically for debugging and troubleshooting. And today we're going to look at a menu item example. Uh, and as yesterday, the housekeeping item, if you have done your homework and you have identified something that you would like to see as an implementation with Macro Builder. That is, you've identified a sequence of operations that you think would be useful to edit and operate and see the benefits of Macro Builder. You can paste that in the Q&A block now. We'll have a look at it at the end of the call or the end of the webinar. And um, we will be sending out an announcement later today telling you when you can sign up to join the Bone Segmentation Collaboration or the Graph Enhancements Discussion. Those will take place next Wednesday and Thursday, about 15 to 20 minutes after the end of the daily on those days. Uh, again, thanks to Dr. Matthew Junjong. So Matthew is on the line, he is unmuted. He'll be answering questions and steering me in the right direction when I make mistakes. So with that, we are going to dive into the writing a custom menu item extension. I'm using Dragonfly 4.1 and uh, as you know, I've customized it Slightly as described in lesson six, but I am also using the launch Dragonfly from PyCharm, and so I'll be launching it that way at least uh, for the second time I launch it today in the lesson. There are no notes on today's lesson. We're just going to dive right in and start writing the custom menu item extension. I'm going to go over to Dragonfly. And in yesterday's discussion, we talked about different types of extensions. So for example, if I were to uh, go and ask for the Dragonfly developer documentation, it would pull that up, but I already have that pulled up. And here it is. And so we did talk, talk about different extensions. So we talked about the macros and the lookup tables, etc. What we'll be talking about today is a generic menu item. Now, many of these extensions actually have code generators available for you in Dragonfly. Let me show you what that means. I can come over here to the developer tool and you'll see this section right here with the different generator items listed. What you'll see uh, near the middle of the list is generic menu item generator. I'm going to click that. This is going to create valid working Python code. It's not going to do anything until we program it to do something, but it will create code that is syntactically correct and all set up for us to create a menu item. So what we're going to do is we're going to name our menu item. So I'll just call this lesson 32 demo menu item. And I haven't even told you what the exercise is going to be. So what we're going to do in this exercise is we're going to take a set of rulers, or maybe more precisely, I should say a list of rulers, but a list of rulers that user has made measurements with in Dragonfly. And then we will export all of those rulers to a CSV or a comma separate value file. So this is called lesson 32 demo menu item, save ruler, maybe I'll call it export, export ruler properties, to CSV. All right, now we have a name. We have to specify where this menu item should live for now. Is it something that only I should see when I'm logged into the system? And maybe that's what you wanna do. You wanna keep it here while you debug it and troubleshoot it, then later you wanna promote it, or maybe you wanna make it available to all users so anyone who logs in will have this menu item extension at their fingertips. Now, once you have set the name and the location or accessibility, you also have to define, is it going to be a top level menu item or a contextual menu item? So top level menu items mean the menu item might appear in the file menu or the 
the tools menu, or maybe I would make a special ORS menu, or if I were working at Harvard University and I wanted my special Harvard extensions menu, I could have Harvard University. You could put whatever you want up here and that would come up here under custom top level. If you want it to appear contextually when you right click, for example, on objects in the scene elements list over here for data properties and settings, then you will choose contextual. And that's what we're gonna do for today's list. We're gonna set it so that you can select a group, or again, I should say a list of rulers, and then you can activate this menu item. So next is what is the string that should be displayed in the menu item? So we'll just call this uh, export properties to CSV. I'm not gonna put export ruler properties because this menu item is only going to appear when you've already selected rulers. So you'll know that when it says export properties, it's gonna export properties of the selected objects, which will be rulers. Now, the final option here is a section. When you create menu items, we'll see this in a minute, the menu items can be clustered in sections. And so you can name a section so that when you create another menu item, it'll appear in the same section of the list of menu items. However, you can just leave this empty. Now we can also go to about and we can say this is Mike's Dragonfly Daily Lesson 32 example uh, exporting uh, the properties and this will be the title and length of each ruler. All right, now I've got to turn off my, uh, all right, let's see. You know, you tell Windows to turn off notifications and it still gives you notifications. All right, uh, exporting the properties, the title and length of each selected ruler to a CSV file. So that is documentation to anyone who looks at this menu item later will understand what it is supposed to do. And then the authorship information so other people can find it and uh, reference it properly. Now we can click create menu item. And menu item was successfully created. The source code for this menu item has been written and it is available. If I click open menu item directory, then we will see Python user extensions. This is where things go if I select them for current user. And there it is, there is the source code right there. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, close the, yes, I'm gonna uh, close this out. And now my menu item has not been initialized. Dragonfly does not know about the menu item because it does effectively a search when Dragonfly starts up. So I do need to restart Dragonfly. I'm gonna close Dragonfly. And I'm gonna, now I'm actually gonna go over to PyCharm. So PyCharm is all set up and I can start Dragonfly from PyCharm. So I'll click this button. So you can watch the video so that your Dragonfly will be set up um, we, or your PyCharm will be set up properly to run Dragonfly in debug mode. What you can do is you can browse the Dragonfly developer documentation, go to video tutorials, and installation and setup of PyCharm. This will show you where to download, which version to download, and all the configurations you'll need to enable so that PyCharm runs with the proper Python path, finds all of the appropriate source code, and can launch Dragonfly with the proper environment variables. So we see Dragonfly is running now. If I, uh, let's, uh, let me see if I can think of a data set to import. Let's do import image files and we'll add and uh, well, what is this? Let's go up here and let's go to Dragonfly daily data. doesn't really matter what we load, but let's load, I don't know, we'll load the denim data. Uh, click all and do denim and uh, load. So this is the data we did in the uh, deep learning image segmentation example. These data come from uh, Rigaku, courtesy of Aya Takasi and collaborators and colleagues at uh, Rigaku Americas. So thank you, Aya and your colleagues for these data. Now we have a image data set loaded and we might have made rulers. Like here is a fiber bundle of small fibers and maybe I make a ruler measurement and I say, oh, what is this length here? And I'm interested in what is this dimension here? And we might call the first one small fiber bundle width and we might call the second one large fiber bundle width. Uh, Matthew, can you read the comments and uh, and chat um, uh, chats that are coming in? And if it's important, you can interrupt me and just uh, since you have audio turned on. So uh, if it's important, just I, let me know. For the chat, I see only mine. Uh, okay. 
All right. Well, so what we have here is we have a data set, we have two fibers, and what we'd like is for when the user selects both of these, I can right click and, oh, there it is, export properties to CSV. So that is the source code, or sorry, that is the menu item that we have created. Now let's have a look at the source code. I'm gonna pop over to PyCharm and I'm going to, let's see, what is the uh, best way to navigate? Here we have Python user extensions and here we have generic menu items and there it is, lesson 32 demo menu item export ruler properties to CSV. I'm gonna double click, the source code is loaded. This is what was created when we clicked that button. So it's created a bunch of source code. It is valid and working, but it doesn't do anything because no one's written the specific behavior that is required at this point. Now, there are three methods I'm gonna draw your attention to. The first is a method called get is selection valid. What happens is every time a user right clicks over here, it looks at the get is selection valid method for all of the menu items. And then if it says true, it will show it in the list. So if I do not want that menu item to appear when I click an image channel, I'll see it says get export properties to CSV. I don't want it to show up then. I only want it to show up when I have selected fibers. So what I can do here is I can define a method that returns true when certain conditions are met. And this can be any conditions. It can be quite simply, is my selection include rulers and nothing but rulers? Is my selection non-zero, et cetera? You could say, I only want this menu item to appear after 5 p.m. on Friday. So you can write whatever conditions you want. Now, what we're going to do is we will uh, go ahead and define this function right now. So let's see, let me pull up my notes. We are going to, you see here that we have uh, an example code. Here's example for the selection should be made only if the user has called the selection or called the menu item with two channels selected. So I just need a, a bit of definition. So when I have a selection here and I right click, this selection, right now it's two rulers, this selection gets passed in as a collection of objects. So essentially I need to interrogate a collection of objects. Here you see a piece of code, let's uh, uncomment it. Here you see a selection of code that says, um, if a collection of objects is none, or if it is a length of objects that is not equal to two, return false. Because remember that was the example they were suggesting. Finally it says, Selection is only channels, and so they're defining a Boolean value here to return true only if you call the isInstance method on each object in the collection of objects. So this is a syntactic operation in Python that evaluates everything in, in an iterable list, and if each one of those returns true, and then you call all, then this only returns true if every one of those is true. So really what I wanna do here is I want to test not for is it a channel, but is it a visual ruler? Now I have just referenced a class name that is not yet have definition in here. So if I expand my import statements here, I can add from ORS model import visual ruler. Now I can now ask the question is each instance in this collection a image ruler. I'm not concerned if it's uh, uh, if it's precisely two right now. Now what I have done is I have uh, said uh, it, it is true if it is a, it's a collection of rulers but you know I don't want this even to be evaluated if the list is empty that would be a uh, more robust way of doing it so I can put if uh, a collection of objects is, uh, it's not so easy when I'm trying to yep. read notes over my shoulder. Uh, yes, Matthew. If it is none, or if the list, yeah, so if the collection of object is none, you turn false. You can do it in the two, two right. steps or in uh, one sentence. Very so good. it would be return false. Right, so we want to return true when the conditions are met, return false when the conditions are not met. So the first thing we do is test yep. for is collection of objects none. And With a cap capital F for false. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. And then the second condition is uh, it has to have at least one object in there. So right. if the length of a collection of object is zero or smaller than one, whatever, you how you write it, it's <laughs> the same. Right. And then you return false. 
Okay, so this method, get is selection is valid, is going to test very quickly and see if the collection is uh, somehow uh, not defined and is pointing at nothing, or it'll test to see if the length is less than one. In either case, it will turn false. Then it will evaluate this expression, testing each instance in the list for if it is an instance of a visual ruler. And if all of those return true, this returns true, and then it returns that condition. So that's basically saying, if this is true, return true, else return false. So that is done. We don't need this piece of code right here. Now that defines our get is get selection is valid. We could write in here uh, some comments. Uh, just uh, confirm that a collection of objects is not none is at least one object, and all objects are of type visual ruler. All right. Now uh, we could correct our typos. And that is the first function. So all that does is define uh, how to evaluate whether the function should show up. Now, if we um, re-imported this method and we came over here and right-clicked, then we would not see it appear right here because this would is not of type visual ruler. Now that brings us to one of the developer tools, something called re-importer. Matthew, do you wanna tell us how re-importer works, how I can find this method and um, re-import the source code that I've already updated? Yeah, you can type in in the filter line edit the name of the class or the module. Something like lesson 32, would that work? Yeah, probably. Enter, and then you can do the expand all. All right, so you do have this tree structure to help you filter because you might type something like macro or channel and have uh, you know dozens or thousands of entries. So I've typed lesson 32. I've navigated in the tree. Here is the uh, the. Uh, module. module and now I can click re-import selected modules because that is what is selected click the button and wait for dragonfly to re-import now if I come back over here and I uh, select a couple of rulers I see export properties to CSV if I right click on this I do not see export properties to CSV so we know that code has been X is uh, is re-imported with the fresh code. So this is a remarkable time-saving device. You don't have to close Dragonfly and load Dragonfly every time you edit the source code. So that is the uh, the explicit purpose of the re-importer, which I mentioned yesterday but did not show yesterday. Okay, back to the source code. We have defined this method, and now we see two other methods to define. Now the next method is also a sort of a bookkeeping method to make sure everything is working nicely together. It is called get menu item for selection. So Dragonfly has an idea of a or a data structure for a menu item, and the menu item has a title, an ID, a section, and an action, and also has other optional parameters. So this is all defined for you. You could uh, strictly choose not to change any of this, and it would work fine. You do recall I defined a section, or I specifically left the section blank, so that's telling Dragonfly where to put the menu item. You see what the title is. The ID refers to uh, the actual identifier for the menu item. And then the action uh, specifically specifies what's going to happen when the menu item gets clicked. In this case, it's going to use this class method and enter the menu item entry point, which is the next method we're going to define. So we could leave this alone. We could uh, also add optional arguments. So if you looked up the documentation for menu and uh, you would see, so we could actually do that. We could pop over to our uh, documentation page. I don't see it, uh, here it is. So I could do, min oops, gotta type menu correctly. We could type menu, pull up uh, uh, generic menu items, and uh, and, oh, and this gives us uh, this documentation. Um, Matthew, where do I wanna go to see the, uh, the, the scope of that menu, of other menu parameters such as checked or enabled? Okay, I'm just looking at it. Um, okay, so you go into the extensions page. Okay. So during a 541 documentation, you can just click Here at the are. top left of the page, uh, generate menu item. Uh, or no, excuse me, in the infrastructure section. Oh, okay. So in the section explaining all the, the plugin sections. Uh, so menu are. item is right there. So you go in the 1.2 menu item section, you see uh, menu items are specified. Are. Yeah, so go in there. And then just a little bit at the top of it, go mm -hmm. up. Um, so here's menu item right here. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, right there in that right. link. So here's the documentation menu item. Here it describes and it specifically gives a reference to the AeroS service class uh, documentation. 
And yep. this will give you all of the documentation that we were just referring to, title, section, action. You also see optional arguments such as enabled or checked or submenu. So you do have the capability of adding submenus. You can have options that must be enabled. So they would, uh, uh, I don't know, if they appear grayed out when they're not enabled. Um, and then uh, uh, you can also have options that, uh, that are checked. So there are other parameters you can use, but we're not gonna use any of those right now. Yeah, so like for this uh, menu, um, if you want to modify title or a section, there is no problem about that. You can just modify it as long as you want. Uh, I would recommend the ID and action strings to leave them as they are to avoid any other problem further. Very good. Thank you, Matthew. Yep. So that defines the first two methods. The next method is what happens when the user selects that menu item. Now. Um, there is some example code here, but uh, I, I think we can just uh, clear out this example code. We're going to uh, go here where it says, uh, put your code here. I'm going to uh, clear out uh, these uh, examples or suggestions. Now, what we are going to do is we are effectively going to open a file for writing our CSV and we're going to uh, write out, so this can be a CSV. So we want a header line that tells us the columns. Uh, so we're gonna have a title and a length, etc. So we're gonna write the column headers and then we're going to write for each entry, we're going to write a new line in the spreadsheet. So write a new line uh, for each ruler. So that's basically what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with opening a file for writing our CSV. Now, what we would like to do, you will note that a menu item does not have any parameters. So when you have, for example, the property panels, we have all of these uh, checkboxes and sliders that have state information. But when you right click a menu item, you're not passing in any checkboxes or sliders. There's no text entry field that says this is going to be the name of my file. So we are going to actually prompt the user for a file. Um, and we can use the queue file dialog. So we could just, uh, uh, open up a, we're going to use the queue file dialog, dialog from Qt, so I could just do Qt file save dialog and uh, pop up uh, this class and it'll give me the documentation, so queue file dialog and there is a queue file save, so if we search for save, okay, um, is this the one I want, get save file, get save file name? Save file name. That looks about right. So what you see here is you can execute this command and it will um, uh, it will return a filter and it will return a file name. And basically it's going to prompt the user to navigate to a folder on disk and find a file name. Now for in order for us to use this, let's see, let's look at my notes. I have, yeah, so what we'll end up doing is we'll define a selected file name and filter. Those are the two things that get returned by this particular method, which is called qfiledialog.get save uh, file name. Now I did misspell dialog, so we'll fix that. And inside the get save file dialog, uh, what we will need to pass it as an option or uh, is a caption. So we may say instruct the user uh, Please uh, select a file name for saving your CSV export of selected rulers. That is going to prompt the user so they know what they, they want. Now, for me to use this queue file dialog, I do need to do an import up here. So we can uh, say from pyqt5.qt widgets import queue file dialog. All right. Now, this is going to get us the file name, right? But we do need to uh, do some checking for robustness. So we can say, um, for example, in case the user hits cancel, when the user is prompted for a file name, then this variable will now have the value uh, empty string. So I can say if selected file name equal then I will return and exit this method. And so the, it'll be as though nothing happened and the user could then uh, choose another menu item or choose this menu item again. Now, um, the next thing we will do is, I mentioned here that we're uh, in this idea of open our file for writing. Can now, me, Mike? Yes, go ahead, Matthew. Line uh, 78, it's uh, equal, equal. Ah, thank you. All right. 
real-time human syntax checking. Um, now, that's in case the user hit can, hits cancel. Now, what we need to do in order to open a file for writing is we can say out file equal, and this is just pure standard Python, so you guys have probably done this before. We can open the selected file name uh, for writing, whoops. And in this case, uh, uh, for maximum robustness, we could uh, specify that it should be uh, encoding equal UTF-16. Okay, so we have defined an out file for writing. Now, um, I mentioned that we're gonna write the column headers. Let me look at my notes, do, do, do. let's see. Looks good to me. Um, all right, so we have defined the file name. It's gonna be prompt the user for a file name, then we're gonna open the file for writing. Now, we're going to write the column headers, but before we do that, uh, a CSV file has to have a delimiter. So it is comma separated values, but it doesn't have to be commas. It could be uh, semicolons or colons or tabs. And so we are going to need to specify the delimiter. So let's uh, get a delimiter. Now, we could say the delimiter will uh, equal a tab if we don't have uh, anything else defined. So we could say that, but it turns uh, out- backslash. Backslash instead of a forward slash. And thank you. And then, uh, so, but it turns out we don't have to specify. We could actually get it. It is defined in Dragonfly user preferences. So we could ask the user preferences for the get value because there is a specific parameter called CSV delimiter. So I could assign my delimiter, delimiter equal, and I can ask preferences. Now, I won't be able to ask preferences until I import the right preferences. So before I do that, I'll come up here and uh, we'll put it, uh, is it right here to put, okay to put it? Um, oh, it would be after the ORS model. Here we are. Yeah, and usually we have ORS model, libraries, service class, helpers, Python plugins. Something like that? It's uh, ORS libraries dot preferences. There we are. Right. So now, and all of this is spelled out uh, not only in this video, but in another video and in the online tutorial, which with written documentation for all of this example. So I can now call preferences and I can get value in the specific value that I want to, uh, preferences to return is a value called CSV delimiter. Now uh, I've got it, but if I want to uh, be extra robust, I can say if delimiter for some reason is returned as an empty string, then I will set delimiter as this default tab. So now I can, now I have a file open for writing. I have specified my de delimiter and I wanna start writing. So I might wanna write column headers. And I'm going to, uh, we're gonna write uh, two things in the column header. Uh, we're going to, well, let me just specify the column, uh, the column names. So we're gonna write out two things for each, each entry. We're going to write out the, let's call it the ruler name. So in Dragonfly, we call it a title, but if we go over back to Dragonfly, we see this is small fiber bundle width and large fiber bundle width. So let's say you think of that as the ruler name. So we're gonna write out the, the ruler name, and then we're gonna write out the ruler length, right? So we might write out ruler length. Now, um, we're going to actually refine this code in a few minutes, but let's say uh, we wanted to do that. Now, instead of writing out ruler length, um, we might wanna tell the user, is the ruler length in millimeters or in meters, etc.? And so uh, what are we gonna put here? Well, we can ask Dragonfly what the user's preferred unit length is. So I could say something like uh, default uh, length unit, and I can ask uh, preferences, right? I can say preferences, get, and we saw this in an earlier, in an example earlier this week, so I could say get default and um, let's stop right there. And you see that PyCharm is giving me prompts. So there's a, a unit for angle. So it could be degrees or radians for surfaces, for volumes, but I want the length unit. So that's gonna return the uh, length unit. And what I now that I have that uh, length unit, I can ask for its uh, string or its abbreviation. So maybe I'm in millimeters 
and uh, Dragonfly you normally knows that when you want millimeters, it should say MM. So I can ask for the length unit abbreviation. So I'll write length unit abbreviation. And I can ask the default length unit for the, let's see, uh, default length unit dot get unit abbreviation. And if I just do that, now I have the length unit abbreviation. Um, now I believe in Matthew's example, we could also um, do some string curation on this. So I could say length unit string equals, and now we can use the uh, Python 3 syntactical operation where we uh, pass in the format. And I'm going to create a string. So you see it down below, I've written ruler length parentheses, uh, and then I want the mm to go here. So I can actually define that here. I could say ruler length and put in parentheses and I'll, I'll put a space parentheses. And here I want to put in uh, the string evaluation of length unit abbreviation. So the syntax for this is, uh, what is it? A curly brace at this point? Yeah, right. Length unit abbreviation. And then I will close parentheses. So this will give me a string that says ruler length, open parentheses, mm, close parentheses, if mm is my unit. So right here, I'm just going to put in length unit string. So I have defined the column headers, column names right here, ruler length and unit length string as a list of length two, except I have a a string there. So that gives me a very robust way. So if I'm in meters or millimeters or whatever, it's going to uh, identify that and then tell Dragonfly, or, uh, Dragonfly's output or CSV writer what unit to write in that column header. Now I'm going to have to write lines to a CSV and I'm going to write the column header line and then I'm going to write the line for each ruler. So it's useful here to actually define a, a separate function for writing a line to CSV. So we could actually define a class method, write line in CSV file. So I'll come down here and I will say uh, class, uh, I wanna get my block position right. Does that look right? Class method. And then we can say uh, def write line to CSV and what we'll give it is uh, of course the class we'll give it the out file the list of strings to write and the delimiter in case it's not specified it uh, when called it can use the tab all right so we're going to define them yes it met you backslash D backslash why can't I put the right slash operators so um, so what we're going to do here is once we have column names then we can call this function and uh, this will simply say CLS underscore right line to CSV, and then we'll pass it the out file and the column names and the delimiter. And then we're gonna do something just like this uh, when we get down to writing a line for each ruler, right? So we'll iterate and then we'll call a line like this, but instead we'll put the uh, ruler properties string list. So we'll define this in a minute. So now we've uh, written, a, uh, we're going to write a method that we can reuse for this purposes. Okay, so if you look back at the organization of menu item entry point, we um, open a file for writing. Um, we make sure the user hasn't hit cancel and if they have, we handle it properly. Then we get the delimiter, then we're gonna write the column headers, write the line to file, and then we will uh, out file close at the end of uh, the execution of that method. So close the file. All right, now if we want to write to CSV, we can, let's see, let's go ahead and look at how we would write this code. So the file is already open and, you know, I don't need, I'm, I'm all lost in my notes. Um, so what we will do is we will call out file dot, uh, oh, you know what? We're gonna define the specific string to output. Let's say we call this an output string. And what we can do is we can use the uh, string join function. So I could say list of string dot join. And if I invoke list of string with the join function and pass it the delimiter, what it will do is it will return a single string that is the first item in this list 
plus the delimiter plus the second item of the list, it'll go all the way through the n minus one item yep. of the list. In fact, Mike, it's the opposite. You have first to specify the delimiter as a string, and then inside the join uh, in the argument, you pass the iterator, so the list of string. Like this. Right. All right. So, uh, and then that returns the uh, output string. Okay. Sorry about misleading you. Also, we'll call this the out string. And um, now I can take my out file and I could call write. And I want to pass it the delimiter. Now, remember, this is a text file. And after every line of the text file, we want a new line character. And we'll see if I remember to put the write slash this time. So we could put, for example, the output string plus a uh, backslash in for a new line character. How's that look, Matthew? Yep. Okay, so this is the method. And so when we get to the end of writing column headers, we've defined the column headers and uh, it's, it's taking care of whatever our default unit is. And then it's um, gonna call this and it's gonna write this. Now, um, now we want to write a line for each ruler. So what we can do is we can iterate over each ruler in our list. And let me see if I can find my notes. I completely cannot find my notes, so I think I'm just going to have Matthew tell me what to type for a few minutes. Um, yeah. Matthew, is this where we want to go next? Yeah. Um, so it depends if you want to write immediately the for loop for each ruler. Yeah, so we'll do so for, for a ruler, ruler. Mm -hmm. in the list of rulers. So the list of um, rulers have been passed in uh, argument of the method. So the argument um, method takes in the argument collection string. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you go, the list helper dot from Python collection at the top, ah. top is the collection of object, and so uh, maybe you want to rename that uh, line seventy two. Right. The collection so, of objects is in reality the list of the rulers because right, you have. So let's call this yeah. List, list of ruler. uh, rulers. Right. All right. Okay. So for next ruler in list of rulers. Okay, um, you can make sure the ruler is not, not none to avoid any other problem. So if next ruler is not none, then you enter there. Uh, then you can retrieve the title or the name. Right, so, so we specifically defined that we would, we would refer to these names so we can say uh, next ruler name equals next ruler dot get title. I don't. Okay. Then you can retrieve the length. Get length. Right. You need to pass as first argument the time step. So for now you All can right. pass either a zero or you retrieve the current view for which you ask for the right. current time step. So but this is, now. yeah, so I'll just uh, specify this very quickly. Rulers, like every other object, are four dimensional. So you could have one ruler that is this bundle width. And if that ruler changes in time steps two and three, it can be encoded in the same object name with the same title and it will have a different length at different time steps. So we do need to ask Dragonfly what time step is the user in when they have called this function. So we do need to uh, identify the appropriate time step. And all of that is because this uh, get length is going to force us to define the current uh, current time step or refer to a time step. So what we can do here is in order to, we're going to define a time step, but we are going to have to actually ask Dragonfly for uh, the uh, current view we are in and we can get the view from the working context. Is that right, Matthew? Right. All right, so I'm going to come down here in OS ORS libraries imports from ORS libraries dot uh, working, context. working context import working context. Now we did see the context observer yesterday, which defines these parameters such as the view. So what I could say is current view equal working context dot get current view. Whoops, I don't. You can tell I never use PyCharm. Okay, and do I need to pass a parameter here? You can pass none. It okay. will take the current context. So it will take the current context. So that gives me the current current view. And then for time step, 
um, how can I get the time step from the current view? Usually we define time step as zero, and then if the current view is not done, we can ask the current view for the current time step. It's just to make sure that the return of working context get current view is a valid object. So we prefer to start with the default value that is correct, and then right. if the current view is not done, Right. So yeah, that's it. There we are. So we now have the time step, so we can get the appropriate length. So now, uh, next ruler to get to get length, we'll pass it current time step, and we have the length. Yeah, it's just uh, argument is name time step, or it depends. Line uh, ninety eight and one hundred. Do you want to name it current time step, or uh, at line one hundred six you? Yeah, let's pass in time step. Time step, and the second argument to get length is a matrix transformation, but usually we don't. So you pass none as second argument. All right. So now we have a ruler name and a ruler length. The ruler length at this point is in units meters, because that is how things are encoded unless you ask Dragonfly to uh, translate it into your default units. So, but we can do that quite easily. So let's do that uh, processing here. Um, Matthew, what yep. do we need to yep. do to transform a ruler length into the proper uh, transform? We're going to just move the decimal place. How do we do that? Yep. OK, so you first ask for your default unit length, if it is not none first. So if default length unit, uh, default length unit? is not none. And that's what we defined up here, default length unit, by asking the preferences so that it returned millimeters. So if it is still, if it actually evaluates as not none. Yeah. Then. So the ruler length in the unit equals default length unit dot get reference unit converted to unit. OK. So what we've done is we've asked this object, which knows it knows its state of millimeters, and it can convert the float value, which is returned in meters, to the appropriate. Um, and yeah, so sorry, this is the, yes. the next ruler length. So that will actually convert it from meters to whatever our default unit is. Yeah. Uh, in the situation where default length unit is none, then you just put the ruler length in unit as the same value as you had a return from the get length. Right. So it will be in meter in that case. Right. So if we don't have a conversion, then we'll just pass it back in meters. OK. Yeah, All this right. is uh, next to ruler length. Thank you. All right. So that will define next ruler length. And now we can create a string uh, to pass to out file, which is basically going to be um, uh, oh, what does it take? It takes a list of strings. So basically, right, right here, instead of passing it a uh, ruler length string, we know that it just takes a, a list. And so we could pass it next ruler name. And ruler next, it says here ruler length in units. Maybe it would be a little more clear on the code if I called it next ruler length in units. and next ruler length in units. All right. So that will output uh, that line to the file. All right. Yeah. But to add line 112, you need to put a tab inside the for loop. <laughs> All right. Okay. So for each ruler, evaluate and then write. And, and also, the next ruler length in unit is an actual value. It's a floating point value, you need to uh, convert it into a string before you can pass it to write line to CSV. Excellent. So you can have whatever the formatting you need. Uh, you can do just uh, our EPR on the value that will But we have appear. a class that will take a, a float and convert it based on the number of decimal points the user has, has spe specified in right. preferences. And so um, there is a, a helper class, is that right? Yeah, it's the format helper. Okay. So at the very last uh, line 28 from RS helpers dot format helper import format helper. 
uh, it takes in consideration the local as well. So if you want right. your decimal point or your comma for a thousand separators to be right. if it's, adjusted. Uh, if you're in North America and it's 2.3 millimeters, you may want it written that way. And if you're in Europe, you may want it written that way. And so this is all taken into context. So you're back basically grabbing two things from the preferences at this point. You're telling it how many units of precision, because that's defined in preferences, and then you're using this separator. Um, of course, you could choose not to use a separator if you if you wanted to format it yourself. But let's just take this and we will say uh, formatted uh, ruler length. Um, We'll call it in units, and now we can call a format helper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, format helper. No, no. Excuse me. <laughs> the the class. Yeah. Format number. Format number. And you pass the uh, the number. Right. Okay. So this is going to uh, do both of those things: put in the right separator and put in the right number of, of units. Put in yeah, the right so number of decimal points. Yeah, you just have to agree with that variable name. So right under your cursor, you have name it next ruler length in units. Um, oh, excuse me, line one thirteen. Yeah. Right. So now we're ready to uh, paste in this formatted. Right. Okay. Um, no, excuse me. Just things. copy what is at line one eleven and paste it in one thirteen. All right, so now this will write out that line. Um, uh, and uh, ruler. again, uh, 113 should be uh, tabbed inside the if. Yeah, inside okay. this. I don't know how I keep putting it in the wrong place. All right. Um, all right, so now we have updated this code. We could, at this point, uh, re import it and uh, give it a try and see if we can actually generate a CSV file. Oh my gosh. Look at there, there's an error. Yeah, there's an error. Uh, line 120, there is a colon missing at the end of the line. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to go over to the re-importer. And uh, I can select it and update list of imported modules. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's a button, re-import selected module. Ah, sorry, uh, re-import selected modules. And, and by the way, and when you look in you. your when you look in your Python console with the reimporter, it tells you if the reimported has succeeded. Here we are, successfully reimported. Yep. Okay. All right. Now we can go back here. We can select a couple, and we can right click and say export properties to CSV. And now here it is, and we can say uh, bundle with measurements CSV, and click save. And uh, it's done the operation. If we want to check it out, I could navigate to that folder. Let's see. And uh, so let's go to it wasn't downloads, downloads and then we'll go to Dragonfly Daily Data and Denim. And now we have this. And let's see if we can just open it with a Notepad. All right. Ruler name, ruler length in millimeters, and there it is. The first one was 1.0155, and the, and the second one is 0.0683. Now I'm going to tell you two or three things. I'm not going to write any more code today because I'm out of time. I want to tell you that when you make this selection, it is an ordered list, and that is the list in which it will output it. The second thing I want to tell you is we can do as another exercise, or you can watch the rest of the online video, you can add a very simple documentation string to make this method captured by the macro recorder. That means if you make this video, uh, if you make a recording of your actions and you make uh, ruler measurements and then you output them to a CSV, then when you play it back, it will not only make your measurements, but your customized code of exporting to CSV will also be captured and repeated in the macro. So. Um, I, I suggest you watch uh, the video, or at least watch the last half of the video, which talks about uh, uh, adding the macro uh, behaviors because I'm not going to, or adding the interface method decorator so that you can call it from a macro. I don't have time to do it right now. I have to end the lesson. So I'm going to stop and take uh, three or four minutes of questions. But I do recommend all of you have a look at this video. Uh, if you've already watched it, then you probably know everything I've shown you today, but you have the chance to ask questions. So the video I am Just referring to is video tutorials and developing a generic menu item. Go ahead, Matthew. you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I am now going to just uh, go to questions.
and uh, ask questions. I'm going to take your questions for just a few minutes. So can you set up other Python IDEs, such as Spider, to open Dragonfly? You can, and there's documentation telling you. When you, if you Just watch the part of the documentation that tells you how to launch PyCharm, and you'll see how to set the environment variables. It is g generically designed so that you can launch PyCharm or something else. The documentation just shows you specifically how to use PyCharm, because that's what our developer team uses. Can you pop the captions on again? I'm afraid I can't do that for today, but you can. If you watch it on YouTube, you'll be able to turn on the YouTube captions. So um, another vote for histographic segmentation to deconvolve peaks. And when do you expect to announce the content of the next lessons? Well, I'll tell you right now. Um, we will start with, uh, we'll resume on Tuesday and we'll have four lessons in a row. And Tuesday we'll be using, we'll be doing volume rendering with the next generation rendering engine of Dragonfly 2020.1. In fact, all of lessons next week will use Dragonfly 2020.1. Uh, I expect on Monday we will make available Dragonfly 2020.1 release candidate for download. You'll be able to download it from the website and install it on your system alongside Dragonfly 4.1. You can either overwrite or you can install alongside, so you can have both versions installed. So that lesson on Tuesday will be um, uh, uh, 3D rendering with the next generation renderer. Then I think the lesson on Wednesday will be the segmentation wizard um, in 2020.1. Then the next lesson, I believe, will be an introduction to application wizards, where we'll look at the plug analysis wizard and the bone analysis wizard. And I can't even remember what Friday's lesson is on. So we'll be looking at what's new in Dragonfly 2020.1. You'll be able to download a release candidate if you want to follow along and, and do it on your own. So um, last chance, last chance to ask questions. I have Matthew on the line. So please uh, uh, ask questions right now. Okay. Um, well, good. I'm glad you have no questions because I'm out of time. But uh, thank you so much, Matthew, for joining me. And thank you, everyone, for paying attention. So uh, if you have more questions on Python content, I think we should definitely consider a different seminar series on Python content because it's really hard to fit these in these 25-minute Dragonfly dailies. But since you asked them, I wanted to give them to you. So this concludes our week on customizing and extending Dragonfly with these last three lessons about Python. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, everyone. Stay healthy. Uh, be good to each other. And we'll see you again on Tuesday. Watch your email for announcements. You will get an announcement of what the next webinar topics is and announcements, uh, other Dragonfly Daily announcements. You'll get that this weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.